Hi there, so welcome to uh, this last lecture on uh, titanium, the last lecture in this series of eight. Uh, the first four on alloying um, and alloy production, and the second four on titanium. Um, and uh, what we'll do in this lecture is uh, we'll finish off our conversation on fatigue, particularly uh, we'll focus on uh, a particular issue of dwell fatigue, and then we'll think about melt anomalies again, um, so we'll return to that issue, and then we'll think about uh, near alpha and uh, heavily beta stabilized alloys and biomedical alloys. Um, and, uh, and we'll think a little bit about armor and corrosion just to say that it's out there. Um, but what we've done really so far is we've seen that um, titanium alloys don't work harden. Um, so once deformation begins, uh, then they tend to suffer from localization. They don't have a lot of uh, cross slip of C plus A slip. So once you start to get prism slip going, um, then that tends to keep going, they localize, uh, you don't get a lot of plastic hardening around the crack tip. Um, so they're initiation resistant for fatigue, but once they start to crack, then the fatigue crack growth rates can be uh, quite quick. Um, so most of their lives are spent in the initiation step. Fatigue crack growth step is relatively fast. Uh, in part, that's because we're using them at such a high stress, right? Um, if we use them at a lower stress and life on fatigue crack growth, we'd be okay. But the attraction is, uh, that they're fatigue resistant, we can use them at high stresses. So then they spend most of their lives initiating the crack, and once it starts to go, it goes. So um, let's think about dwell fatigue. Um, so about uh, we we saw when we looked at Sioux City, about a quarter of jet engine disc failures hazard the airframe because um, they're uncontainable. There's so much energy in the disc that it will escape the containment, and then there'll be fragments that uh, may hazard the airframe. Um, with potentially uh, unfortunate consequences. Um, and so it's important to look at um, unusual circumstances. Um, dwell fatigue is a phenomena uh, affecting aluminium alloy, alpha titanium, under conditions of very high stress. And it's called qual cold dwell fatigue because it tends to happen um, at low temperatures, you know, up to about 100 degrees C. Um, and here's a, a picture of what happens in LCF uh, when we have nice striated fatigue crack growth there, the striations, there's some more striations. Um, this is uh, TIE 811, which is a, an alloy used in the States. Um, it's got a lot of aluminium in it, notice. Uh, it's a near alpha alloy, it's predominantly alpha, there's very little beta there. Um, and it's been cycled in this paper by Pilchak and, and co workers at uh, uh, very high stress, 758 MPA. Which is about, um, which is 95% of its static yield stress, uh, at a low R and quite a high frequency, 30 hertz, and it lasted uh, a long time, 139,000 cycles. The striations appear as slip steps, uh, classical sort of fatigue striations, and they're about 150 nanometers per cycle. It's one striation per cycle. That's what we normally would expect to see fatigue crack growth. We might initiate from a facet in LCF, but fatigue crack growth um, in normal conditions. So then uh, turning to, to dwell fatigue, when we take the same alloy at the same stress, um, same uh, bar, same paper, um, and we put two minute dwells at the peak stress. So it's still a one uh, load up. Uh, there's a two millimeter dwell at stress, a one second ramp down and a one second hold at the low stress. Then, instead of having 139,000 cycle, cycles life, we get 10,500 cycles life. So that's a dwell debit of about 13 times, it's a 13 times lower life. And then we see lots of facets on the fracture surface. It's a very faceted fracture surface. And we see uh, multiple initiation sites uh, by tracking the river lines. You have to go and look carefully in the SEM, but tracking the river lines back. There's multiple initiation sites. Uh, one of which won and grew and overcame the others. Um, and then when you, you go and look in on those initiation sites, then you see something like this. These are uh, the ones that you see in continuous cycling, and they're very, very flat and featureless. There's no river lines on them. There's no nothing at all, um, and very, very featureless. If you look at tensile-loaded ones, you might get a little one there that's kind of featureless, but mostly you get river lines growing away from nice river lines, uh, and therefore um, that's from a tensile test on the same bar. 
And so uh, uh, large-ish featureless facets are a good indicator of uh, dwell. Um, if we come and look at one of these guys, one of these initiating facets, there's the initiating one there, and there it is tilted. Um, when you then grow away, the other facets growing away show river lines, show features on them. Um, and when we look at the dwell facet itself, we can, um, by tilting in the microscope and looking at how the facet plane changes in size, how some index markers change in, in, in relative position, we can figure out what the tilt of that facet is, and then we can put that facet on the EBSD orientation at 70 degrees in the SEM, so the beam comes down and goes out to our EBSD detector, and we then find the orientation of that facet, and we find that the dwell initiating facet is very much an 001 facet, whereas some of these growth facets here, 2 and 3, are a little bit further away from 001. Um, so that is, they're breaking on the hard plane. And this facet, when you look at um, its facet plane relative to the 001, which is the way Adam does it, um, then you find that the facet plane is tilted, in this case by about 14 degrees. Um, so uh, then uh, the, the secondary initiation sites tend to be a bit further tilted away, um, and uh, as it's sorry, the secondary growth facets as it's um, growing away, and they are uh, both further from 01 and more inclined. And the dwell facet notes are really nice and featureless. So dwell is a, a still a, a research topic. Um, we're applying that STRO model um, where we have a soft oriented grain that slips back and forth that then creates a shear band that then breaks the hard oriented grain that's this dwell facet because it didn't have really very much resolved shear stress on the facet plane at all um, when it was loaded because it's nearly that way. Right, so it's resolved shear stress nearly none. Um, so the question, so it must have uh, initiated its cracking via some applied shear stress from some adjacent grain that was in a soft orientation that was deforming. So just to make some comments on dwell, it's a significant concern for aero engines. Um, back in the early 70s, uh, Rolls Royce had some problems with dwell fatigue actually. Um, the mechanisms aren't yet fully understood. Um, but we can say uh, the following things. Dwells associated with creep at near yield stresses in titanium. Uh, titanium, uh, when you take it up to nearly the yield stress and hold it, tends to creep. And it seems to be associated with that uh, plastic relaxation. Um, the dwell facets themselves are relatively featureless. Um, they appear a bit more like tensile testing facets than HCF facets, but they're very featureless facets. Um, they're near O2, but typically a little bit away, and that makes some people think that they're associated with uh, hydrogen. Um, hydrides tend to form uh, slightly off O2 to accommodate their stresses um, on a plane about 14 degrees, and that's significant to some people. Um, Unlike HCF and LCF facets, which tend to be inclined, they're perpendicular to the loading axis, so that's why we invoke the stro mechanism. Um, dwell facets tend to be subsurface, and they may grow in association with hydrides or by with hydrogen, we don't know which. Um, uh, it may be that hydrogen moves to the regions of high triaxial tensile stress, um, and then when the facet goes, they precipitate out. We don't know. There are some indications on factor surfaces, but we don't really know. Um, and one thing is dwell fatigue is quite hard to study because you need to have that bad grain pair, or at least so the hypothesis goes at the moment, and so you need to test quite a large volume of material to find the worst pair in a large volume of material. So what you see is that disks in spinning rig tests tend to fail uh, at lower stresses when they're dwell fatigued than uh, you find um, for test pieces, and test piece specimens may not be therefore representative of what's going on in disks, and that makes it a very complex and difficult problem to study. It emphasizes the, the difference between large volume testing, which is what you're doing in a real aircraft, um, versus test piece testing in our labs. And as we go as a community to smaller and smaller scale testing um, with more and more instrumentation, then that presents a challenge because uh, the reality, of course, is still large volumes of material. So that's the end of the discussion on fatigue, is this little piece on dwell.
Um, we'll, uh, we'll now turn to consider our, our back to titanium metallurgy and we'll have a, a, a little sprint through that. So we've talked about one type of melt anomaly. Um, uh, we've talked about hard alpha inclusions when we talked about Sioux City. Uh, there are a couple of others to think about, one of which are high density inclusions, um, so called HDI. And they're historically usually, um, they were tungsten related, so things like uh, TIG torch tips, um, tungsten carbide cutting tool debris, something like that, something that is coming um, into uh, the melt. And what you find is, is that then when you VAR melt them, they don't dissolve because uh, you don't have a lot of superheat in that big deep uh, melt pool. Um, and actually, because they're high density, they drop straight through the melt to uh, the, the, the cold zone that's solidifying um, and without dissolving very much at all. So, you know, people have told me about experiments where you take a, a, a tantalum or a tungsten uh, little ball and put it in, the, in somewhere in, in the melt and melt through and it drops straight through to the bottom. You always find it in the bottom. And y actually, if you go and look for it, you can hear it rattle afterwards. Because they have a different thermal expansion coefficient, they contract differently to the melt. Um, so they debond from the surrounding titanium on cooling. Um, so then they rattle away. So what you're seeing here in this image, there's a, uh, your HDI. There's the hole around it. There's the titanium ingot. Um, and you may knock them out, of course, when you process them, when you do your hot forging and so on. So uh, they're relatively easy if they're badly bonded um, to detect by ultrasonics, but it's not always the case that they will debond and that you can find them by ultrasonics. So uh, consequently, uh, you're not allowed uh, to have any of these sorts of, th particularly tungsten, uh, but uh, in titanium plants. Uh, it's also a problem if you have things like uh, molybdenum that you're putting into your alloys in addition. If you use um, uh, starting materials that are too coarse, uh, too large, they may not melt properly and you may end up with this sort of problem. Um, but it's uh, particularly a problem for tungsten. So in a, a titanium plant, if you go to a titanium plant, they will ask you for your ballpoint pens and they will take them off you and give you a pencil or a felt tip pen that you can happily drop into the melt and it won't cause any problems. Um, and, you know, there are apocryphal stories about people in the Cold War going and scattering tungsten ball bearings into melts and that sort of thing as a form of industrial sabotage. Um, I don't know if they're true, but it's a funny story. Um, so that's uh, HDI. And now we turn uh, to back to hard alpha. So this is the best image I've ever seen of a hard alpha. Um, this is uh, uh, from a, a colleague in Rolls-Royce. The hard alpha inclusion was here, um, and this is a high oxygen or high nitrogen or both um, region of titanium um, that was introduced um, you know, with vacuum leaks or um, exposure to oxygen during welding together, uh, the original uh, compacted billet um, or whatever the problem was. Um, some of the oxygen will diffuse in processing into the surrounding titanium, so you get a ha uh, an all-alpha rim here. So what we're seeing here is a rim where it's 100% alpha phase. Um, and because it's hard, again, during forging, during processing, they tend to debond, so often you'll be able to detect them by ultrasonics, but not always. Um, and, I mean, as we saw in Sioux City. Um, so uh, these are, we have to get rid of these, and the HDI, both these are called LDI sometimes, or low density interstitials, but the high density interstitials, we have to get rid of these um, by not introducing the defect into the melt in the first place. And that's uh, how we do that. So then uh, the other type of defect we want to consider are so called beta fleck. Um, so here is uh, the, the tie iron phase diagram. Um, and we can see that uh, the beta eutectoid formers have this uh, eutectoid here, um, and they also have a eutectic there. Um, and uh, if you put too much in, then you will form a eutectoid. Um, but you also have a problem whereby, uh, potentially as you, uh, as you melt, uh, you can get uh, macro segregation in your ingot. You can get um, things a bit like thermosolutal jets. So uh, where you get um, material that's uh, of, a of a lower density at the end of solidification coming up through the dendrites. Um, 
and, and forming um, uh, regions of very high beta phase content. So that's what you tend to see. Here's a region. You've got your nice alloy out here and some big beta grains that are 100% beta because they've got a lot of the beta stabilizer in, um, be it chrome or iron um, or whatever it is. So we tend to limit uh, chrome, iron, manganese in our alloys for this reason. Um, and they are, they're, they're fine, they're solid, but they tend to be softer because you don't have the, the fine alpha beta microstructure and so they tend to be sources of crack initiation. They're not as bad, but they're still undesirable. Uh, and again, they're difficult to detect, except by macro etching and looking at the surface. Um, and so that's uh, our third defect type we try and avoid. And we try avoid that by um, not using alloys that are vulnerable to beta fleck. Basically, it's a, it's a limit on how far we can go in alloy. Um, one thing I, I probably should say is uh, don't be afraid. I've talked a lot about cracking and defects. Um, because we don't want to have failures, um, and uh, but we also want to run the materials as hard as we can, so um, there's a balancing act to be struck whereby we're trying to keep it safe, uh, but use the lowest mass engine we can that's as efficient as we can have it. Um, so this doesn't mean we have lots of incidents. So this is um, traffic, um, millions of departures growing, um, and this is the accident rate, number per million departures. Um, and you can see it's really declined through the 70s and 80s. And now we're at very low um, accident rates. The only problem is as traffic growth picks up, um, this is for um, the, whole jet en the whole aircraft business, um, then the number of accidents per year would also pick up, uh, you know, this, this data cuts out understandably in the mid 90s um, because the traffic growth will get you there you know the the, the random things associated with um, you know pilots doing strange things or funny things happening in airports or whatever it is will start to build up and and the, the concern is we need to keep driving this accident rate down to stop this accident uh, number per year becoming so large that there's an incident um, in the papers uh, uh, very frequently um, and one thing to say though is only one in 25 hull losses actually has an engine involvement. You know, mostly they are other issues. Um, and a fraction of the hull losses will actually involve loss of life, right? So, you know, somebody runs off the end of the runway, they may write off the plane, but everybody got off okay. Um, so uh, they're different things. So, but this is the, the number we track. Um, and the concern is we have to keep driving this down in order to stop having headlines. Um, and you might ask, well, you know, um, why do uh, air accidents result in headlines, whereas, uh, you know, nobody minds about the thousands of people who die on the roads every year? Um, and the answer is, I in some ways, sociologically, that's, that's reasonable because it's out of our control. We're in a plane. Uh, we feel that it's an unnatural thing to be doing. Um, and potentially lots of people's lives are put at risk at one go. Um, Whereas on the roads, we're in control. We chose to make, take that risk. Uh, it's a one-by-one one, uh, death rate that we can understand as human beings relatively easily. We don't feel vulnerable in the same way. And that's, that's a big sociological issue. Um, you know, if you take a purely autistic approach, then you would say this. Um, uh, this is from January 2014, before the Malaysian Airlines uh, uh, aircraft that disappeared and the one that was probably shot down over Ukraine. Um, but in 2013, then 224 people died in airline crashes in total. That is something like 3 billion people boarded 35 million flights, um, and only 224 died. Um, that is 400 people died in the US in 2013 falling out of bed. Uh, that's the statistic there. Um, and uh, so if you take an autistic approach, you just say, well, we're terrible at evaluating risk as human beings. Actually, there's more of a sociological reason why well, we don't mind the 400 people dying, falling out of bed, but we do mind the 224 dying in plane crashes because it's a risk that's out of our control. Um, but nevertheless, we, I don't want to, in all of these issues about uh, conversations about defects, imply that um, air travel isn't very safe because it is very safe. It's incredibly safe. And we want to keep it that way, and that's why we think about defects and try and avoid them. 
end of end of soapbox. So uh, now to think about armor and corrosion a little bit. Um, uh, commercially pure CP titanium uh, is is quite widely used in static applications for things like corrosion resistance in chemical plant. Uh, titanium uh, uh, is very very good in corrosion because it forms this adherent oxide scale of TiO2. Uh, it's very very thin, nanometers thin. That's protective um, in normal circumstances. Uh, zirconium is even better, which is one of the major reasons why we use it in uh, nuclear reactor fuel clad. Um, and CP tie actually accounts for a, a lot of the titanium that's melted. And that's principally strengthened in two ways. One is by the oxygen content. If you increase the oxygen content, you increase the strength. Um, and uh, low oxygen content is something like 170 MPa, 0.4 weight percent oxygen. And you need to multiply that by about 3 to get to atom percent. Um, is uh, something like 480 MPa. Um, that comes at a cost in the ductility, um, and but you do get better fatigue life here, um, and uh, you can go up to about 70% of the um, uh, of the yield stress. In fact, in fatigue, um, but it does come at a cost in ductility if you if that's your primary concern. And there's a nice micrograph of CP titanium. It's an all alpha structure. Uh, you can get if you try hard enough, relatively fine grains. Um, and make it even stronger than that. But that's a typical sort of CP tie structure. Um, not very strong, not very exciting mechanically. Um, it obeys the whole patch relation, so you can use grain size strengthening. This is uh, inverse square root of grain size against uh, the, uh, the yield stress uh, for different oxygen contents. And you can get um, higher and higher strengths if you go to finer and finer grain size. Um, and uh, the, the thing about uh, CP tie that's unusual is that it twins. So aluminium alloy alpha tie uh, undergoes C plus A slip, or at least such is the consensus. Um, there is some debate to be had about that. Um, whereas uh, CP tie undergoes twinning. So this is one of the twin modes. Um, and here you see a reorientation um, when you uh, put it in tension that your matrix flips, undergoes a rotation uh, of uh, 34 degrees. Um, and what that does is it, it reorients the material. You can see the twins there. You can get twins, secondary twinning as well. Uh, and that gives you a bit of plastic relaxation. It also gives you some subdivision of the grain and some work hardening. So that tends to be a desirable thing. Um, the only problem is it, it tends to exhaust. Uh, the maximum strain, if you fully twinned all of the material, would be something like 8%. So it doesn't give you very much strain. So by the time you get to 20 or so percent strain in 30 percent strain in total, you start to exhaust the twinning mechanism, and then uh, you run out of work hardening, and you and you neck and you die. Um, so uh, that's CP tie, as I say, primarily there for corrosion resistance in static applications. It's also used in things like uh, you know um, heat exchanger tubes, um, uh, hot air systems, that sort of thing uh, in in aircraft. Um, now, our, our favorite alloy, TIE-6-4, it was originally developed as an armor alloy, um, as a low-weight armor for the US Army and Navy. Um, so uh, the US Army uses uh, this stuff in things like tank turrets, um, where they may use it in a cast form uh, or, um, or in, a, in a plate. Um, and the thing about armor is, you know, you don't, it, most of the time it's not doing any structural purpose, and Therefore, you can live with uh, some level of defects. So you don't need area level defect control. So you only need to melt it once <laughs> rather than three times. Um, and you can, you can do things like chip recycling. with, um, And also, you, you, you use it as large plates that you bolt on um, sometimes. So your bite-to-fly ratio can be one. Whereas for a disk, it's probably something like 5% of the material in the disk was in the original melt. Um, so it can be dramatically cheaper. Uh, these are some pictures of some uh, titanium alloys that have been shot at um, with armor-piercing rounds. And the way that they uh, evaluate the effectiveness of, uh, of these materials with respect to um, uh, impact damage is they look at um, the velocity for different... Uh, these are, are different materials. This is uh, 
uh, World War II steel armor. This is an aluminium alloy. This is TIE 64. Um, and this is the threat. Um, 7.62 millimeters armor piercing rounds, um, uh, 0.50 caliber, half inch armor piercing, 14.5 millimeter armor piercing, long rod penetrators. Um, and um, then you evaluate the velocity at which 50% of the projectiles penetrate. Um, you'll usually get some backside spalling um, because you, you of the way the, the stress waves work as you go through. Um, the way a lot of these rounds will go through the material is they will actually tunnel their way through. They will m very nearly melt their way through. They take the material all the way up to its melting point. So it's actually the specific energy uh, to melt the alloy that's the key criteria here. How much energy do you need to melt it for a given weight um, rather than its um, high strain rate performance per se. Um, and uh, it depends a little bit on thickness. But you get a um, scaling the V50, scaling the density, so you get a, a performance ratio, and so you would say that um, uh, against these different threats, um, especially against the, the larger diameter threats, then titanium tends to perform significantly better, um, and so that's why the US Army use it for things like tanks. Um, particularly important if you want your, uh, your armored vehicles to be air mobile, I guess. Um, just as a, a historical note there, um, and uh, the other thing to say about uh, about high rate performance is why do we care about it? Um, is because actually the high rate performance is also important for things like containment casings, um, for bird strike scenarios, those sorts of things, for the, the fan blades at the front, and the consequence for the uh, containment casing. Um, now, the other thing other type of alloy we want to look at are near alpha alloys. Um, and there are two we'll consider. One is IMI834 and one is 6242. Um, 6242 is 6 aluminium, 2 tin, 4 zirconium, 2 moly, and it has a touch of silicon in for reasons we'll discuss in a moment. IMI834 is actually kind of t similar. It has more tin, um, similar zirconium level, lower moly, bit of niobium instead, bit of carbon. And they're used for high temperature performance in compressor drums, um, where uh, we want the material to have good creep resistance. And the reason we use near alpha alloys is that the diffusion rate in the alpha is 100 times lower than that in the beta. So the activation energy for dislocations to climb in creep is much higher, so their creep rates are much lower. This is um, uh, figures from Lutgering and Williams for them in two conditions. This is R-micro through four in a bimodal microstructure. You can see the primary alpha grains. Uh, you've got some grain boundary alpha there um, on the beta subgrains probably, and then some lath alpha in between. This is 6242 with a lamella microstructure. There's the lamella, and there's very little to no beta in the grain boundaries. I mean, there is a touch, actually, very little. They're near alpha alloys. Um, and the beta there means that it's uh, relatively hard to traverse these things. Um, and uh, if we look at the performance, this is, uh, you'll be familiar from nickel alloys, this is stress against the Larson-Miller parameter. The Larson-Miller parameter remembers a way of folding the temperature and the time together in creep performance. And this is the, therefore, for a given uh, temperature, uh, and a given time, so for a thousand hours at 500 degrees C, um, at a stress of 200 MPa, IMI679 would accumulate a strain of 0.2%. And um, uh, and then you, you, so alloys that are that way on the diagram are better. Uh, diagrams that are that alloys that are that way are worse. So your uh, 6.4 is here, 8.11 near alpha alloys there, 6.242 is there. 6242 with a bit of silicon zins there. I might through fours over there. Um, Temiluminide actually is all the way over here. It's a little bit better again. And your beta alloys like beta 3 um, are worse than 64. So yeah, compared to 64, if you take, uh, let's take a stress like 300 MPa, 400 C for 64, 300 MPa track all the way across, 600 C for I might through four. So uh, reading that diagram, you'd say RMI834 has a temperature capability 200 degrees higher than 6.4. Um, that's 100 hours. Uh, no, even. 
250 because a thousand hours you'd be at something like 320 degrees uh 370 degrees there so 370 up to uh no no it's the lower line 600 to 400 so it's about 200 degrees better okay um so uh the the question uh here is, is why is that and the answer is just simply that diffusion rate in the alpha is lower so dislocation climb uh is harder um so we get rid of the beta um and have just an alpha alloy and we'll get better creep performance now why the silicon in both 6242 and 834 um and um it's, there's really two things going on um as i say the diffusivity is lower um so dislocation climb is 100 is slower so you want to maximize the alpha fraction um and the other thing these alloys do is they have a lot of aluminium in, so they have a lot of alpha-2, and the alpha-2 phase has even lower diffusion rates uh, because now if, an if you, you can make wrong bonds, uh, so you have to get the, them into the right bonds, so the dislocations have to go in pairs. Um, otherwise, you get, and you get antiphase domains and stuff like that. Um, and uh, here's a, a picture on the left of the alpha-2 precipitates um, in, uh, in 834. Uh, that have been produced after only a day of aging at 700 degrees, so it's stacked full of alpha-2. That will give it problems in dwell fatigue, but it's okay because we're not going to stress it at low temperatures, um, or at least we hope we better not. Um, so one thing there is uh, if when you're operating your engine, that means that you would be nervous about spinning a compressor up to full stress cold. You'd want to get it warm first, which means you, you want to do spend some time taxiing around the airport before you pull the push, push the throttles forward to full full thrust um you don't want to just turn your engine on and go um and uh so you know that's from a fuel point of view and an emissions point of view at places like heathrow you probably do want to turn it on and go but if we're using these high alpha alloys then we can't do that we have to give it a bit of time to soak and to heat up first so that we don't put it into a dwell fatigue situation um the other thing we do is we put silicide. So this is um, a bright field TM micrograph of some silicide particles that have formed in the, this is an alpha grain, this is another alpha grain, in the beta ligament in between. Of course, silicon um, well in these alloys will tend to go uh, to the beta. And so we form uh, silicides along the grain boundaries. And they're like grit, stopping the grain sliding over each other. That's the way to think, think about it. They're inhibiting grain boundary sliding. Um, and that they'll probably also inhibit dislocation grind across the grains. Um, so those are the near alpha alloys. Um, and as I say, we use them for the high temperature applications. So there's a, a period as you heat up through the jet engine, as you go through into the compressor, before you get to nickel, where there's a space for these alloys, um, where you want that extra 200 degrees of temperature performance, and that's where you put these in. Um, the other type of alloys we think about are uh, near beta alloys. Um, and there, there's two we'll consider here. There's a, a number that we could consider. Uh, we'll think about Ti-1023 and Ti-5553. These are alloys with a, a lot of, mol of um, beta stabilizers in. So 1023 is 10 vanadium, 2 iron. Um, triple five is uh, 5 moly, 5 vanadium, 3 chromium. Uh, so they have quite high moly equivalents, um, and they are mostly beta. They both have uh, a touch of aluminium in uh, to suppress the omega phase, um, and uh, that also gives you a, a two-phase region. Their transverse temperatures, uh, where the beta turns to alpha, tend to be lower, something like 850 degrees C or so. Um, and what we do when we process them is we process them in the alpha-beta regime at uh, temperature like I don't know, 810 or so degrees C, uh, where there's a little bit of alpha there. Um, they form initially as, as laths, of course, but as we forge them, we break those up and they end up being small primary alpha particles. There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. Um, there's a whole bunch there. They're nicely broken up um, into globular precipitates and they stop the beta grains from recrystallizing and growing. Now, we can't make the beta grains small, but we can form subgrains, which is what we've done here, um, which are pinned by the, uh, the primary alphas. Um, and then when we cool it down, we age it, um, and uh, we'll get some grain boundary alpha on those subgrain boundaries. But we also precipitate, notice the scale bar, that's a 250 nanometer bar, some very small alpha 
in between there's an, a little alpha precipitate uh, for the primary alpha and we precipitate very small alpha in between very highly strained so that then gives you a very high strength so strengths like 1400 MPA UTS or 1250 for the yield um, and they're very very tough so we use those for landing gear so this is um, uh, a, a 787 tu truck beam forging um, and the big thing is we've um, we introduced 10 T3 for some little bits on the landing gear in the 777 but then the 787 and the A350 uh, use these for the big truck beam so the wheels go on here and the main vertical spars there um, and this is um, a couple of whole ingots that have been alpha beta forged then being machined um, and uh, Although they're called near beta is actually the fraction of alpha in them once they've been aged is actually quite high. Um, they're aged at something like 550 degrees C. Basically, the lower the aging temperature, the more alpha you get out, the smaller its length scale and the stronger it is. Um, and the alpha's then very, very strong. Uh, the, the alloy's very strong. These primary alphas actually don't give you a lot of strength, and it tends to fracture from those. It's but they act to pin the subgrain boundaries and they act to nucleate the fine scale alpha, so you have them just for that purpose. So you want enough of these to pin the grains, but as little as possible otherwise, so that you've got all the, that alpha to form in there. Um, so those are the, all of the um, alloys that are widely used. We use TIE 6-4 um, in hip implants, uh, in armor, and as our main alloy for uh, relatively cool applications in blades and discs. Uh, we use IMI 834 or TIE 811 in an even strong alloys like 6246 in as we go back into the compressor, as we get to higher temperatures, um, and uh, we use these, uh, these landing gear alloys in a couple of specialist applications where we want very high strengths, but it's a room temperature application because um, they don't uh, basically have the fatigue performance um, and they don't have the ductility. They're tough, but they don't have the ductility. There's another class of alloys we're just going to spend 10 minutes on that have recently been the subject of a lot of research around the world. Um, there are lots of guys uh, very excited about these. These are monstrously heavily alloyed beta titanium alloys. Um, and uh, uh, this, this alloy, gunmetal, um, was actually the subject of a 2006 science paper. Um, and they are designed to be biocompatible because vanadium uh, is bad for biocompatibility. Um, and you want to have lower moduluses for your lower stiffnesses for your uh, hip implant components. Um, there's a phenomena in uh, hip implants where, or implants in general, where bone only grows or will be retained when it is mechanically loaded. That is, you know, if you go up into space, if you're an astronaut, or if you're bedridden, uh, you lose bone mass actually quite fast. Um, so if you put a very stiff component in as an implant, then uh, what you find is, is it takes all the load off the surrounding bone. The bone then isn't loaded because the bone's less stiff. Um, you know, bone has moduluses anywhere from sort of 5 to 15 or 20 GPA, depending on what sort of bone it is. Uh, cortical bone's quite, quite stiff, um, whereas uh, other places are, are less stiff. Um, and uh, then when it's unloaded, then actually you get the joint loosening, not because of any wear, products but just because it's not loaded so it doesn't grow there so in order to address that you need to have lower modulus um, implant structures which takes you down the road of using foams um, of using uh, uh, which also the bone could grow through um, and it takes you down the road of using lower modulus alloys and um, uh, so these alloys are aluminium and vanadium free alloys for biocompatibility um, with lower moduli. So normal titanium has got a modulus, a, a Young's modulus for about 100 GPA. These have moduluses as low as 50 GPA. Um, you can have them uh, with quite fine grains. This is an example of a, uh, an alloy in that condition that doesn't have very big grain, that has quite big beta grains. Um, of course, 100% beta stabilized, uh, at least uh, on cooling. Um, quite quickly, if you age them at 300 degrees, then you actually develop omega. Um, uh, they're not stable to the omega transformation. But uh, if you uh, just, if you're never going to expose them to temperature, you might hope that that's okay. Um, and uh, this is a, a plot that shows that the 110 shear modulus actually you did problems on this in 203 without realizing it, um, where 
pure titanium is here, and as we add vanadium, then we take the, the C prime modulus down, we take the electron per atom ratio down, and actually that seems to be a scaling. All of these uh, gun metal type alloys are down here. Um, the beta in Ti64 that's about Ti20V is there. Um, and so you have a very low 110 shear modulus, actually. Um, and that uh, is quite important for the dislocation behaviors. Uh, it's quite important for the strength, and it's important for the, for the modulus there. Um, and uh, here's some guys in, in China. Uh, Professor Howard RMR has an alloy um, called 24 IBM 4 zirconium 810, so 2448. Um, and this is uh, with a low oxygen content and high oxygen content. Now, oxygen strengthened, of course. Um, oxygen is still a good solution strengthener. And what you see is, is that as you load it and unload it, you can get super elasticity. That is, you get bending, which is entirely recoverable, or nearly entirely recoverable, on unloading. And the question would be, why is that? Now, uh, we've met the omega phase before, where we take our, our BCC111 planes, and if we squish these together, we form uh, an omega phase, a, a hexagonal structure. There's another phase in the titanium phase diagram, which is metastable, which is an orthorhombic Martin site. So here, if we take, this is a BCC unit cell, if we take four of them, we can then identify an orthorhombic cell, alpha double prime Martin site, and if we stretch that a little bit, well that's what we get, is we get an alpha double prime Martin site that is, um, has uh, its atoms on its face centers, it's a face center Martin site, quite often there's a little displacement on the C face as well of one of the atoms. Um, uh, called a Wickoff shear, and that is the Martin site that's forming as we load the material. It starts forming here and ends forming here, and that is giving us this amount of strain, a couple of percent strain. Um, so you might ask, well, you know, that's very nice. That gives me a lower modulus, effectively, if I load it up to there for my hip implant. Uh, so it lowers the modulus yet further from this number to this number. Um, so that could be very nice. Um, and it, it, it we may be able to use the hysteresis here for uh, energy absorption or a variety of things. Um, actually, a few years ago, that was very controversial, that this is a stress-induced Martin site. They were showing super elasticity like Nitai. Um, so here's 2448. Uh, this is synchrotron diffraction. We're seeing our BCC diffraction rings. And when we uh, load the material up and look at the diffraction rings, we see a whole load of additional peaks. And that can only be because there's a new phase. Diffraction tells you about the phases present. Um, and the new phase then does fit to be that alpha double prime orthorhombic Martin site. And when you unload it, by and large, those peaks go away. They don't entirely, actually, but they by and large go away. So that is, it really is a stress-induced phase that disappears when you unload it. Um, if you look at, uh, in TEM afterwards, then you can see these chevron structures. And if you go uh, and look in dark field, you can s this is looking down the 113 zone. Uh, this is looking down the 110 zone. Not quite distorted enough. You've got these four peaks here, which are the omega. And in between, there's a little spot, which is your alpha double prime. If you come along an image with that little spot, then you can light up particular variants of the alpha double prime, so you can see it in TEM as well. Um, there's yet more phenomenology of the deformation of these alloys. Um, this is uh, gunmetal as received, and this is after 200, 200 low cycle fatigue cycles at 750 MPa. It's yield stress about 800. Um, and here you've got a, a load of shear bands that you can see in TEM, um, and uh, or slip bands. Um, what's going on with my TV there. Um, the other thing that you see after doing that same deformation is that uh, the omega that was very hard to image, that was just streaks in our diffraction pattern, now turns into spots. And we can start to image very fine omega precipitates. They're still very hard to image. So that's weird. You know, you're deforming it, and you can uh, put in the high pressure phase without having done any diffusion or rearrangement. Um, and the question is, why is that? Uh, why does that happen? Uh, and that's not really answered in the literature. I, I can think of two possibilities. There might be more. Um, one is that in moving the dislocations around, you're making diffusion quicker. You can have pipe diffusion down the dislocation, so you're allowing it to form isothermal omega, 
Um, the other is that actually you've got a pressure field uh, around, or a stress field around the dislocations, and that if you have lowered the formation pressure of the omega phase enough, then that might be enough to nucleate omega around the dislocations. Uh, I think I prefer the latter explanation because I think we see it in TEM, but it's very difficult to distinguish. Um, and uh, additionally, as a final thing, around those slip bands, you also can see some very fine, you know, 10 nanometer thick or so, deformation twins. So this is an alloy that is vulnerable to shear. It can shear into a new phase, alpha double prime. It can shear and twin. Um, uh, it can shear and form slip bands. Um, and associated with those, you form omega. Um, so we've made alloys um, back here that have a very low shear modulus and consequently we get a range of phenomena associated with that low shear modulus and shear being very easy in that crystal. Um, and uh, that's an area of, of current research that is exciting a lot of papers. So where are we at? Over four lectures, um, we've progressed to the point where we can examine pretty much the full range of contemporary topics in titanium alloys. Uh, we've looked at one um, there that's a research topic um, in biomedical beta titanium alloys, it's very much fringy. The main line of titanium work, um, titanium research and titanium applications um, are the aerospace alloys, are things like fatigue, 64, 6246, um, things like RM834 are actually slightly fringy um, in that they're not used very widely, um, only in a few stages in compressors in some engines. Um, and we've looked at, at CP tie and things like that. Um, we've looked at landing gear alloys that are also actually slightly fringy because it's only one application uh, in landing gear. Um, there's actually quite a lot of it melted now for the 787 and the 350. Um, but the main line of the alpha beta alloys is 64. I don't want to give you the impression that um, uh, really those biomedical alloys are mainstream, but they are good fun in research and people are having lots of fun developing them at the moment. Um, and we've looked at, at melt anomalies as well, and armor and corrosion applications just a little bit, uh, just to round off the course. So good work, good for persisting with it. And uh, what we'll do really in the last uh, class session is we'll think about these issues and also we'll do you know, big questions about the big picture of titanium metallurgy. So I'll see you then.